Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Is that on? No? Hello? I can use the thing if you want. Do you want me to just use this? Yeah, what number is it? Two. Two. Try that. Hello, hello, hello. Here you are. Can you hear me now? We good? Yeah. Okay. So uh, we're going to be talking about digital accessibility. Um, I'm Kelly. This is Aaron. Um, how many of you in this group have done something with digital accessibility in a project that you've been working on? So actually, that's pretty good. Half of the room, I would say. Uh, most of the um, organizations like this that we talk about, it's maybe a third or a quarter of the people have actually done something with digital accessibility. Um, it's a big topic. We've been about this for a long, long time. Uh, what we feel works best in an environment like this is to cover a lot. So uh, I'll be talking about some stuff, and then Aaron's going to uh, go into some of the more technical details as well. Um, we're with a company called Accessible 360. Uh, we're located on Lincoln, Hennepin, and Uptown. And what we do is we help organizations become more digitally accessible. And what that generally means is we're working um, and auditing existing applications that are out there, websites and things like that, working with an organization, telling them what's wrong. Um, we have a help desk to help organizations um, and the developers within those organizations fix the issues. We do QA testing, uh, we do trainings, we do things like VPAs, uh, if any of you have done, been involved in that, or involved in the whole kind of cycle of development. We're also doing more and more design reviews. Um, so when an organization like Olson is building something new, they work with us from the ground up. And that's really um, when we prefer to work with organizations. Because it's a lot easier to build digital accessibility in at the beginning rather than uh, doing it later. So I'm going to go through a few things. What's digital accessibility? I'm going to talk about that for a little bit. Uh, I'm going to talk about some example scenarios and things that we worked with. Uh, Aaron's going to do a screen reader demo and then talk about uh, development strategies. Oops. This is not. Some clicker stop clicking. Oh, there it goes. <laughs> it's taking a while to keep up. Okay, so what is digital accessibility? Digital accessibility is not simply a checkbox on a requirements stock. So we see this time and time again is, you know, uh, we're doing a, a job for someone and they say it must be accessible. So, you know, how do we do that? They just want to check a box and sort of make, make something accessible. And that's really not what it is. You want to think about digital accessibility as a process. It's not just you as JavaScript developers making sure your um, images have all tags. It's thinking about digital accessibility from the beginning. So your designers are understanding it. So your developers are understanding it. So those content managers that are putting those images and things in um, understand digital accessibility. Your QA testers, um, your recruiting people as they're bringing new people in, asking about um, digital accessibility and knowledge of. So it's really a process. And think about it as, um, as a process and not a project. It is the practice of removing barriers and prevent equal access to digital content for everyone. A lot of people think about uh, digital accessibility as a small group of people, and it really is not. Um, it really is not. There's a huge group of people that um, that are affected by digital accessibility, or affected um, by digital accessibility. So it's people like uh, maybe your grandparents that are starting to lose their vision. Um, for any of you in this room like me, you're starting to increase the font size of your on your phone. That's digital accessibility. That is an assistive technology that you're using. It's screen readers, which I'll show you. There's all kinds of other things as well. Um, there's, I'm showing some different hardware uh, options that are out there. Uh, uh, rail reader, uh, a sip and puff joystick. Um, we can send you some links to some incredible videos about using uh, sip and puff joysticks to do some Photoshop stuff. Um, there's all kinds of other hardware devices. Tonight, though, we're going to be focusing on digital accessibility and software, and that's uh, what Accessible 360. So it's not a formidable effort that helps a small amount of people. So a lot of people think about digital accessibility, I've got a tight budget, it's going to, you know, I barely have time to do what I need to do, there's no way I can include accessible um, functionality into my website or app or whatever I'm building. But again, this affects a ton of people. One in five Americans have a disability. 
So that's a huge amount of people, 56.7 million people, and that was the 2010 census, so that number is only going to grow. Um, as I mentioned, the aging population. And uh, you know, uh, digital accessibility and disability fall into four categories. You want to be thinking about all these types of things as you're building, building your applications. So vision, so that's something a lot of people think of in screen readers, and how do I, how do I make my app uh, available to screen readers? Uh, physical. So uh, if you can make your um, website accessible with a keyboard only, um, there's a lot of people that don't have the ability to use a mouse for different reasons. Um, so if you can make your, your application uh, usable by keyboard only, that's huge. And the people that will affect um, are people with physical dis disabilities. Uh, cognitive, we don't deal as much with in terms of when we're auditing. Um, there aren't a ton of guidelines in terms of um, cognitive uh, disabilities. Um, but what that does mean is like having your error messages up um, for long enough so that people can read them, they're not going to pop up really quickly, which we see a lot. And then auditory for things like closed captioning, um, transcripts, and things like that um, on your videos. So I will tell you, and this is something that maybe some of your organizations have run into, there are legal issues. So people are getting sued um, because they're not accessible. And generally, digital accessibility falls under the ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act from 1990. However, the ADA uh, in 1990 didn't really envision websites and things like that. But more and more judges and case law are saying that yes, um, organizations do need to have their websites accessible in the same way that you have your physical um, uh, location accessible. But really what we want to talk about is not scaring people about the legal issues, but thinking about it up front. Doing universal design and spending money, you're all developers, spending money on development and not on lawyers. So think about it up front and you won't have to deal with the lawyers later on. So digital accessibility is very much a standards-based um, exercise. So uh, there's a lot of different things involved in doing it, but it's all based on a set of standards. Um, so it's using HTML5, it's using um, uh, CSS3, uh, it's doing things correctly in terms of documents. We won't get into documents tonight, but doing those types of things. Uh, on apps, there's already a bunch of standards to make sure that your apps, uh, Android, iOS, whatever, are accessible. But the main uh, guideline that we use in terms of auditing and that the country uses and actually the world uses is the WCAG, Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. How many of you have heard of the WCAG or WCAG? So a fair amount of people. Um, so when you're building stuff, the uh, WCAG is talking to you about what you need to do. So it's saying things like images need to have an alternate description. So if you're not able to see that image on the screen, you need to have an alternate description for that. So there's different guidelines about different um, experiences on a website and how each of those um, need to be resolved. Not in terms of code and saying specifically this, this particular piece of um, uh, JavaScript or this particular HTML element needs this, but more sort of a strategy for, for doing that. So there's some different strategies, or uh, different examples of what we do um, for, uh, for people in terms of um, making stuff accessible. Keyboard only functionality, so I mentioned that at the beginning. So the keyboard functionality, that is the easiest to test. So if there's one thing that you can do when you go back and work on your apps, see if you can navigate through your application without using a mouse. Can you open your menus? What happens when you go into that dialog? If you're in that dialog and start tabbing, can you tab out of that dialog and really get in the state behind your dialog, which you couldn't you know, in, in other ways? Hello? Okay. Um, so uh, keyboard-only accessibility is a really good indicator of your overall accessibility. If you are doing things that way, you're generally doing things standards-based, you're generally thinking about things in the right way, and that's going to go a long ways in terms of your overall accessibility. Um, I skip to content link. Is this something anyone's heard of? Skip to content? So a couple people. So uh, you can imagine if you're in an e-commerce site and your kind of primary uh, navigation menu has 100 links on it. And if you're using a, uh, a keyboard only and you have to tab through 100 <coughs> different links to get to the main content to, to purchase that, uh, those shoes or whatever, you can imagine you're going to quickly abandon that site and not buy those shoes there. So skip to, skip to content link is simply an element on the page that is, is not visible, but as soon as it gets focused in terms of through tab, it becomes visible, you can click on it, and then it's gonna to go to your main uh, content on your page. So you can skip kind of the, typically the, the nav and other in, unimportant um, information you might not need on every single page. 
The other big thing is an easily identifiable focus indicator. So focus indicators, from a design perspective, I believe that's sort of run out of style for a long time, right? You have these very, very subtle underlines and things like that. But again, if you're using a keyboard, you generally can't uh, understand where you're at and what's active right now without some type of focus indicator. And they can be made to look good. They can be made um, you know, part of your look and feel for your site. Um, but, uh, but that's really important for, for keyboard only access. Okay, so now Aaron's going to talk about screen readers, and then right after that, we will do a screen reader demo. So do you want to see if you have? Uh, I don't think I do. Okay, yeah, so here you go. Oh, do I? We'll leave both of them. Okay. All right, so um, screen readers. A, are you all familiar with uh, generally what a screen reader is? Yes. So if you think about what a screen reader is doing, it's essentially turning uh, the web page, which is essentially a two-dimensional experience into a single-dimensional experience of either speech or braille. Right? There's no sense of above or below or beside when you're dealing with speech. It's either before or after. Uh, braille is basically the same thing. So what, uh, what a screen reader is presenting to the user is essentially a flattened view of the DOM. And so the screen reader is going to see things in code order. Um, and that's, that's basically the reading order. So, so the, the element, uh, in, the order in which it's, it's going to be read is, is pretty predictable. You just look at your code. Um, another thing to note is that most CSS gets ignored by screen reader users, uh, excuse me, by screen readers. They pretty much just don't acknowledge that it exists. Um, there is a couple exceptions. Display none. Uh, that will cause the screen reader not to read it. Basically pretend like it's not there. Visibility hidden does the same thing. But by and large, most CSS is going to get ignored. What doesn't get ignored is your markup, uh, your, your HTML tags, and uh, things of that nature. So I will say one thing where that's coming to play for me and it's bit me a lot is on floats. So a lot of times you're doing your floats, for those of you doing CSS, doing your floats reverse. So you're flo floating maybe your submit button, your submit and cancel button to one side. And I've done this, and Aaron's taught me on our, <laughs> the apps that we're building. Um, but then they're going to be a reverse DOM order. And so you want to make sure that that is in the, in the, not letting CSS control what you're seeing on the screen and the order that you're seeing on the screen. Yeah, and I think that's also most likely going to affect the keyboard order as well, from, you know, focus order in the keyboard and so. Um, so at this point, we'd like to do a quick demo of a screen reader because it's one thing to talk about how a screen reader sounds and how it reads a web page and sort of the problems we face, but it's another thing to uh, to see it. So uh, we're going to show you that real quick. So watch you get a straight ahead. Yep. Actually, let me turn off the screen reader. Um, let's see if we can scoot this back and put it right in front there. The speakers are up here, I think. All right, let's see. Can everybody hear that? Uh, not, maybe not understand it, but he, at least hear it. Okay, fair enough. So we are on the USPS website. And so just for starters, I'm going to start reading the web page. And this is what I hear uh, as a screen reader user when I go typically go to this, uh, this page. So 
probably a little bit fast um, for most folks. Uh, you know, it it isn't one of those things that uh, you're you're born with. It's something that I've developed over uh, many years of using a screen reader, and uh, essentially you just the screen reader is so verbose that you really can't help but turn up the speed um, just because it takes so long otherwise. I'm going to go ahead and slow it down though. Slower, 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 slower. Hopefully that's sufficient. <laughs> All right, so I'll go back to the top and uh, the first thing it's going to read is the title of the web page. So you, basically that title tag in your head. Welcome vertical bar USPS. All right, so welcome USPS. Let's go to USPS.com site index. Adam Wick is online. Oh, sorry, that was a Skype thing. Same page link, skip all page navigation. Skip all page navigation. Same page link, skip all utility navigation. So those are those skip links that we were talking about. If I keep going down. Link current language, colon English. The current language is English. List of three items. Link English. Link Espanol. So you'll notice it said Espanol. Uh, that's what happens when you don't use a lang attribute to mark, okay, this is some foreign language content. So that, that link should have got a lang equals es to mark that that's, that's Spanish. Link Chinese. Um, so that the screen reader would pronounce it correctly. List end, link locations, link support, link inform delivery. So usually when I go to a web page, what I'm looking for is, okay, where's the main content? That's what I'm interested in. So if I hit, usually I'll hit the H key and that'll cause the screen reader to take me to the first heading. Moving soon, heading level one link. So it says moving soon, heading one. Link. Um, link read more single right point alert colon as of April 30th. USPS.com will no longer support updated browsers. I, I went up a little bit um, just to, to see that. Um, but uh, so I'm not really sure that I'm actually in the main content at this point. Uh, if I hit the H key again. Track a package heading level two. Track a package. Click dash and dash ship register heading level two. So it's not really clear where the where the main content started, but you know I might assume that it started at the uh, the H1 because that that just makes sense, right? Um, here's where you can get caught if you are using your H1, H2, H3 because you need something bigger or smaller. That's not the correct way to do it. You want to base it on the what's the semantic meaning? Is this a level one heading uh, or not? And then use CSS to style. Uh, another thing I can do is hit the R key Welcome. Navigation region. to jump to different regions. So it says navigation region. That is um, most likely from they used a nav tag to wrap that content. And so I'm hearing that. I get that information, that, that semantic context to where I'm at on the web page. Quick tools menu, sub menu collapsed. Same page link, skip quick tools links. So uh, there, I'm going to hit R again. I'm looking for the main content. Search USPS.com clickable. All right, there's a search field. Search the postal store, colon, keyword. Search, another search. Search USPS, search USPS.com, click search USPS.com, enter search term for navigation region. So I just got a bunch of searches, and then I'm now on the uh, navigation the region. Items. Helpful links. Helpful List links. Link so it's not stopping on the main content, essentially. Um, let me just do one last thing, and then we'll uh, we'll wrap this up. But I, I want to show you, um, let me change my address. Welcome. Virtual file. A F E. Enter. Link. Change your address online to make sure your mail follows you. All right. Enter. I want to make sure my mail follows Official me. USB. Let me um, change it on my screen. Oh yeah, go ahead. So. Slower. Slower. Okay. Slower. I switched pages. It hates talking slow, so it it sped up automatically. But anyway, uh, let's. So here we are on this form. I'm going to try to find this, the beginning of the form. Official USPS register change of address heading level one. That's a little too slow. F faster. List of bullet exclusive mover savings. Get instant access to over $1.750 in valuable coupons. All right. So there, there's an ad. I just want to skip bullet, down to the form. Bullet, so let me just. Bullet, the, bullet, the, bullet, the, bullet, privacy act statement. Privacy the act. Don't, don't need it. Of a career, click for link, 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 link terms of use. Link. I understand and acknowledge this continue button. Enter. All right. I'm going to continue. Uh, I understand and acknowledge. Continue. Virtual link. Exceptions colon if you are family radio button not checked. Oh, the USPS just ruined my presentation. Last time I was here, these were not radio buttons. Now they are. 
like they're marked up as rated. I guess they were embarrassed because I always use the site, and so maybe they heard about it. <laughs> but they didn't. They had. They used basically on click and some styling to indicate when their uh, radio buttons were checked and unchecked. And because of that, I was not able to use it at all. Um, I'm glad they fixed it. Well, sort of. Um, <laughs> so yeah. That's uh, that's but essentially you know that because of that it made it completely inaccessible. So, um, uh, but they fix it. So, uh, let's. You want to? Should move we back go back to the stage? Yeah, yeah, let's let's go ahead and do that. Would you rather step on the stage? Is it easier? I assume for the back to see. We'll, we'll do that. Okay. Fair enough. What's that? So when you do that, you're going to fix a lot of screen reader issues uh, automatically. That being said, to be honest, the screen reader is the hardest part of accessibility generally. There is a free screen reader available, uh, NVDA. Uh, it stands for Non-Visual Desktop Access. Every time I search for NVDA, I get uh, links to uh, information about video cards. Um, so uh, make sure you add screen reader in there, um, just to make sure you get the right side. So, Let's talk um, the number one rule of accessibility. Always, always use uh, standard markup. Use HTML properly, semantically, and as it was intended to do. Um, the, just doing this will take your accessibility forward by leaps and bounds. It's, it really is one of the biggest things we see is uh, labels not being used properly, or um, just standard markup stuff that's just not being followed. So don't fight it, just use HTML as it's intended. It's, it's nature's way. Um, so use lists for lists, you know, use, uh, don't use tables for layout. I hopefully don't have to tell anybody that. Um, So other things you can do for accessibility is to provide a unique title on every page. Um, your first tab stop should be that skip the content link. And just making sure that that's the first thing that uh, screen reader users see and also keyboard users. Screen reader users aren't usually going to use those skip to content link. They're going to, uh, they're going to use the, uh, those hotkeys that I showed you. They're gonna try to find your first H1. They're gonna try to find the main tag through that uh, by pressing R. And so uh, if you, again, mark up your, your sites properly and correctly with, uh, with semantic HTML, it's not gonna be a problem. Um, and then uh, just the lang tag, you know, again, if you don't do that, then the screen reader basically has to guess what, um, what language is this in. There's really no good reason to use tab index. So again, the screen reader is going to read the content in, tab, in, in code order. Um, and so if you are using tab index, that might change things for keyboard users, but it's not going to do anything for screen reader users because they're following the DOM. And it's a mess. If you try to use tab index, you're opening yourself up for a whole bunch of pain. Now, there is tab index of negative one. You can sometimes need to use that in order to be able to give things focus that aren't natively focusable. Sometimes that can be appropriate. Uh, and tab index of zero will add something to the normal uh, tab order, the natural tab order, without actually you having to specify it and keep it updated like you would if it was a positive tab index. And then we talked about focus indicators, so I won't say too much about that. 
um, just again, you can customize them to make them look match the look of your site. And I would encourage you to do so. Depending on the browser default, it's not always the best idea. It's uh, a little bit risky um, because it may not have good contrast with your uh, your site's color scheme. So use CSS for styling. Um, <coughs> I think I, we pretty much uh, covered this. Uh, when you're using headings, just make sure, you know, think of your heading structure kind of like an outline. You know those outlines that we used to, uh, to make back in grade school. Uh, never really saw the point until I uh, started using the web. And uh, just make sure that you're not skipping levels and so forth. Um, and then if you do have to, uh, you have some some content on your page that's just really confusing. Uh, you can use a trick in CSS uh, to create screen reader only content. And I actually don't think we have the example on this slide, but if you Google it, there's plenty of examples for screen reader only text. Um, but essentially, what you're doing is you're smashing your content down to uh, a single pixel and then hiding it, moving it off the screen, and all sorts of other stuff. So again, because screen readers ignore CSS, um, they don't realize that this is happening, and so they read that text as, as normal text, um, but nobody else can see it. So that can be a, a, a neat trick. Bootstrap itself has a, a SR's uh, dash only um, class that you can put on, and it's doing, that's exactly what it's doing. Yeah, so, so just steal their, steal their code. Um, <laughs> so th this is the part of the slide where, or part of the presentation where you folks get on Twitter and say, OMG, there's a blind guy talking to me about color contrast, so I'm going to let Casey take over uh, and, uh, and talk about this one. So color contrast is one of those things as a developer that's really easy to test because it's simply a math problem. It's taking your foreground color and your background color and finding a, a contrast ratio and telling you whether it's acceptable or not. And it does uh, depend on the size of the font, so a smaller font needs a higher color contrast, of course, to be able to read it. Um, there's a ton of online checkers to figure out color contrast, uh, WebAIM and others, there's, there's a million of them out there, um, and basically you put your hex or your RGB color in, say calculate, and it'll tell you if it meets or fails the WCAG guidelines. Um, one note, uh, logos and decorative text are exempt, um, so we work with a lot of organizations that said, you know, we spent, I won't say with any agency, but we spent, you know, $20 million on this logo, and it doesn't meet color contrast guidelines. So we encourage them to use uh, colors throughout that, um, that meet the guidelines, but logos and decorative text themselves are exempt. Absolutely. So let's talk about menus. Um, whether they be pop-up menus or uh, just menus that you, you have out in the open, naked menus, um, don't, uh, excuse me, do wrap them in unordered lists. Um, they're a list of links, just wrap them in a, a UL. That makes perfect sense to screen reader users. Use, um, use nav tags as well to wrap the, that content um, as it makes sense. And uh, if you do have submenus, it's actually quite simple. So on the control to open the menu and make sure that the control is clickable. Again, when, uh, when you're building in, in React, you, know, you, you go, they, ha they have all these tutorials on the main site and uh, they show you uh, div, and they say, look, you can make this div clickable. Yeah, don't do that. Um, use a button. Uh, and do the same thing when you have controls that, that open up menus. And on those buttons, or, uh, or sometimes folks use links, um, put an aria-expanded attribute and an aria-controls. And so the aria-expanded attribute gets set to false. That's what it should be on page load, unless the menu is open by default. And you would set it to true. Set it to true when the menu is open and uh, false otherwise. And again, that goes on the link that controls the content. And so does the aria-controls attribute. And that gets the ID of the tag that wraps the content that pops up when you open the menu. Um, if you have any questions about that, feel free to come talk to me afterwards or, uh, or reach out to me. So we already covered headings and landmarks. I don't think there's much else to say about that other than a lot of, uh, so landmarks are basically what you get when you use those uh, nav, header, footer, article, and so forth. 
those all become landmarks. So screen readers hear that and, and, and you know, okay, here's the start of an article, or here is the beginning of the footer, uh, and so forth. So use those to your advantage. Give screen readers hints on what sort of content is, is coming up. Because again, when I use a screen reader, I'm seeing a, a flattened view. So there's no concept of, oh, this is right next to that. So that's, that's what this is. Um, so give as many semantic clues as you can. I'm kind of harping on this, uh, you know, semantic HTML, but that really is um, a huge percentage of what makes up good accessibility. Most of the times when we're talking to clients, we're telling them uh, to fix their markup mistakes. Uh, not not entirely, uh, but it's it's certainly a big percentage of the issues that we find. Um, so let's talk about alt attributes. Every it wouldn't be an accessibility presentation without a discussion of alt attributes. So alt attributes that's where you put your descriptions of your images. Uh, pretty straightforward. The one thing I will say where most people go wrong with alt attributes, they say an image of something or other, like an image of a cat. You don't need to tell the user it's an image. They already know it's an image. All you have to do is put alt equals and then quote cat, close quote, and you're done. Um, because uh, cat pictures are important to describe. Uh, that's what makes the internet work. Um, so the other thing to think about is rather than starting off with, OK, this is an image, I need to describe it. A better approach, and an approach that's probably going to get you better alt attributes, is to think about the image and what information it's conveying. Because if you just follow this to the letter, and maybe you have a link, uh, and it has an image inside it, and you describe that as right pointing arrow, that's not terribly useful to me as a screen reader user. What's far more useful is alt equals continue. Um, so, again, you want to tell the user what the image is conveying, not always necessarily what it's showing. And sometimes you do want to just describe the image. You know, sometimes that does make sense. But, but think of it from that direction <coughs> first, and you'll probably end up writing better alt attributes overall. All right. Um, if you do need an image to be uh, ignored by a screen reader, and the only time you would really ever want to do this, if the image is not in a link, um, unless it's in there with some other text that labels the link, or uh, if the you know, and, and if the image is purely decorative, it, uh, it's something there to to give a nice feeling. You know, maybe it has a picture of a family on a on a page about uh, uh, savings accounts and saving for your family. You know, I don't really care as a screen reader user what clip art folks chose to use. Um, it's just not all that valuable to me. Uh, and then when you do have an image that is a uh, inside of a link, and that's the only side, the only thing inside of the link, obviously you don't want to have an empty alt attribute. You uh, want it, the alt attribute at that point is now going to have to label the, the link. So um, rather than saying company logo uh, in the alt attribute, you'd probably say uh, company name, home page, or, or whatever, uh, whatever describes the link, because that's what the image is representing. Icons. Um, you know, I honestly don't want to really say too much about this, except go to the Font Awesome website um, and take a look. They have a whole page on the accessibility of icons. It lays this out far better than I could in the uh, short amount of time that we have. Uh, really excellent site, so just search for Font Awesome Accessibility, and uh, they have a whole page. And, you know, a lot of libraries work very similarly to, uh, to Font Awesome. Uh, so it's it's a good reference even if you're not using Font Awesome. So forms um, use labels. Um, label you have to have the for attribute. So often we see just a dangling label, a, a label that's off to the side of a form field. It's wrapped in a label, but it doesn't have a for attribute, so it's not associated with any of the uh, of the form fields on the page. Obviously, not, not great, it doesn't help screen reader users at all. Now screen readers will guess, they'll try to guess the label, but don't make them guess, because they'll basically uh, get it wrong a lot of the times. Um, so make sure you always have a label, um, you specify it. 
if your design simply cannot handle a, a label um, for whatever reason, you can use an attribute, put an attribute on the input or the other, uh, or the select. Uh, it's aria-label, and then inside there you would put your label text. But that's best avoided if you possibly can, uh, because it also can, uh, some, uh, it, it may violate one of the uh, WCAG guidelines, which requires you know, visible labels and not just, um, uh, not just screen reader labels. So field sets, if you have a set of radio buttons, is usually where you would want to use a field set. Um, a field set is what you use when you want to group uh, form fields together. Um, and then the legend, is label for the group. So maybe you're asking for somebody to choose an age range. So you have each individual radio button has its own label, right? Uh, 0 to 18, uh, 19 to 29, or whatever. Those are the individual labels for the radio buttons, but you still need to label that complete set because otherwise the user doesn't know what you're asking for. So in your legend tag, that's where you put the, um, the label for the, the field set. Uh, and that has to be the first child of the field set, um, or it won't work, which is kind of annoying. But. Um, if you have error messages, you'll want to associate those with your error, uh, with the form fields that they apply to, and you just do that with an aria dash described by, and you set that to the ID of the element that contains the error message. And that way, screen reader users will know that that association exists and it'll, it'll read it. Um, finally, you can use placeholders or titles if you want to, but they are not labels. They don't suffice for, for labels. So if you do end up doing that, make sure that you use um, a label tag as well or an ARIA label. Um, and then use standard HTML elements for your forms. The, uh, the standard form, the new form fields in HTML5, those are great. Uh, they provide, again, more information to the user, more semantic information. How are we doing on time? We're good. Okay, great. Right. So, tables. This, uh, this slide is, is you know, about uh, tables and, and table captioning and, and uh, descriptions of tables. Um, really, the thing you need to know is use th tags on your headers, every single one, whether it's a column header or a row header, and use the scope attribute. A lot of, uh, H a lot of folks miss this when they learn HTML, uh, but the scope attribute takes either call, if it's a label for a column, a row, if it's, uh, a, column, if it's a header for a row, or both in the rare uh, circumstance where it's labeling both. That's the main thing that trips people up on tables. Otherwise, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Modal windows. So here we get into some of the more advanced uh, widgets. And the problem with modals is that screen readers, uh, unless you take steps to mitigate this, screen readers don't even realize that they've opened. Because the screen reader user is still up near the top of the and you up at the control uh, that opened the dialog, but usually when dialogs open, they get appended to the DOM. And so you have to set focus to um, usually the first focusable element inside the, uh, the modal is what we generally recommend. So if you set focus to the close button, if that happens to be right at the top, that's perfect. Um, give the... Uh, Dialog, uh, uh, role equals dialog, and uh, aria dash uh, modal equals true, I believe, is the, sorry, it's, it's in the new standard. Uh, aria 1.1 came out recently, and uh, um, so this is, um, I don't have it memorized quite yet, but um, it's uh, basically role equals dialog is what you want to put on the element that wraps your dialog so that the screen reader user knows, okay, this is a dialog. Um, and then a lot of times when I'm looking for the close button, I hear times <coughs> button um, because that's, you know, folks use that a lot for the close X. 
uh, just an ampersand time semicolon uh, uh, character entity. And um, I know what it means, but not everybody does. So um, on that button, usually you can just put an aria dash label equals close, uh, and you're good to go. Or you can add screen reader text inside the button. Um, and then uh, make sure you hide, truly hide your um, your dialogues. Don't just move them off screen. So display none when they're uh, when they're not visible. And uh, when you close the the modal, well, first of all, you want to make sure that uh, users can close the modal with an escape uh, with the escape key, uh, and don't let users tab out of your modal. Those are primarily recommended for keyboard users because if the user is able to tab or shift tab out of your modal, then basically, you know, they, they may wander off into the uh, the background of the of the modal and, and not have any way to figure out you know where they are or how to get back to the modal. And then finally, the the last thing that um, this is probably the most often overlooked is managing the user's focus. So. A lot of times what will happen is the modal will go away, and so by default, the user's focus will end up back at the top of the document, which isn't really helpful. Uh, they have to tab all the way back to where, they're, where, they're, uh, were, where they were before. And so if you can, try to return them to the button that actually opened the modal. If you can't do that, or if it doesn't make sense to do that, then put them, try to put them somewhere useful. Now, if you completely loaded a different view, you know, maybe it is okay to land them at the top of the page. But um, just be thinking about that. Where would, where's the user most likely to want to be uh, after they get out of this modal? All right, so obviously um, there's no semantics in HTML. Um, I've been talking about ARIA and I just realized I haven't really given you folks a, a good definition of what that is. So ARIA stands for Accessible Rich Internet Applications. It's basically a standard, uh, it's a set of attributes that you can add to your HTML to provide additional information to, additional semantic information to, uh, for screen reader users. And the first rule of ARIA is don't use ARIA if you can at all help it. Um, because people think, equate ARIA with accessibility, and so when they add lots and lots of ARIA to their page, they're uh, adding accessibility, I guess, and, and making it even accessible or um, so avoid that. Um, don't use ARIA unless you have really looked closely into the um, into the the ARIA role or, or the ARIA attribute that you're using because it um, a lot of times it's just not necessary and it's uh, a great way to make your website less accessible. Uh, to be honest, so. If you do use ARIA, make sure you're testing with a screen reader um, or, or have somebody who can test for you with a screen reader to, uh, to figure out exactly what you're doing. Um, so tab sets. Um, this is another thing that's provided by, uh, H by ARIA. Um, and I would really recommend checking out some of the examples from the W3C. The problem with accessibility is that if you Google accessibility, it's really hit and miss on the quality of um, of content that you get. So uh, try to, uh, to follow the tab examples from the W3C. But basically what you want is a roll of tab on each of the links that controls your tabs or buttons. Um, you want to set aria-selected equals true on the tab that's selected and false on all the other ones. You want to make it work well with keyboard users. You want to make sure that the arrow keys, you can arrow left and right and so forth. Um, the, tab, the list that holds the tabs should get a, a roll of tab list, and the tab panel, where your tab content lives, should get a roll of tab panel. And, uh, there's a couple of other things to, uh, to pay attention to, a couple of, um, a couple of batches. So definitely you know, look that up on the W3C and uh, reach out if you have any questions. So single page applications, you know, a lot of this comes down to just doing a lot of the things that we've been talking about. You know, use semantic HTML. That's, that's the biggest thing. Um, understanding when the page uh, changes, so when you switch to a different view, 
you know, in standard HTML, you uh, you reload the page, and that's that's pretty obvious to a screen reader user when that happens. When you're just updating the DOM to show a different view, that's not always as obvious. And so, think about again, how could you manage keyboard focus? Maybe you want to take the user um, to the uh, beginning of the main content um, when your when your page refreshes, or sometimes you don't have any uh, much navigation to speak of, and getting to your main content is no big deal, so maybe you do want to take them back to the top. Uh, try to think about those sort of things. Also, update, update the page title, um, the title tag. There's a couple libraries that allow you to do this. It's, it's not um, out of the box, I think, in, uh, at least in React. Actually, maybe it is. Um, it's it's not, not easily accomplished without a, a third party library. Uh, I'm sure you can do it in Boo as well. Uh, excuse me, view. I have a habit of pronouncing things like my screen reader. So, view is boo and IRC is irk. Um, so, uh, and then again, just don't make make spans clickable. Use a button um, or a link. Um, so yeah, carousels. Just just don't. Um, you can make carousels accessible, uh, but you can't make them pleasant. Uh, so if you can avoid a carousel, you know, please try to do so. It's, it's, um, you're not helping. People will appreciate you if you just leave them off. Um, both sided and, and non-sided users alike, I think. It's really easy to put together a library and claim it's accessible. Just about everybody does it. Um, so the slide, I think, says trust but verify. Um, I'd probably just say verify. Um, so many libraries claim to be accessible, and they really aren't. Um, so, so make sure that you are trying out the, if you're using components, which you know, hopefully you are. Obviously, it's always a good idea to use content uh, not reinvent the wheel if you if you don't have to, but make sure you are uh, testing your third-party libraries for accessibility and uh, ensuring that they are uh, actually accessible. And if they're not, maybe you can uh, submit a pull request and, and enhance that. Um, so we talked about using screen readers, NVDA. Um, it's totally free. It's an open source screen reader. The most popular screen reader is JAWS, but NVDA is right there behind it, and they both work pretty darn similar. There's also VoiceOver on Mac. I would be a little bit cautious just because it's, it's not terrible, um, but it's not uh, too similar to Windows screen readers, and so um, a lot of times when you use uh, <coughs> VoiceOver, it's, it's going to, it tends to have more bugs, is, is really the case with, with that. Um, let's see what else. Um, you might be tempted to use scanning tools, right? It's, it's an easy fix. I totally see the appeal. You can integrate it in your testing process, many of them, and, and uh, they're, you know, it's, it seems great. Unfortunately, so the uh, UK government did a study and basically found that um, I think the highest accuracy was, was still well under uh, 50%. Uh, and be really careful if you decide to use one. Don't pay for one. If you are going to use one, don't pay for one. There's one free in Chrome um, in the developer tools. So uh, <clears throat> and it's you know comparable to the rest. Um, and uh, but. A lot of times, developers will spend a lot of time fixing things that they call out that aren't actually issues. Or if they are issues, they're so minor that it's, you know, the odds of somebody running into it is, is pretty low, and your time would be much better spent uh, somewhere else. Anything else you wanted to uh, add, K2? Otherwise, um, no, I think that was it. Um, we're a couple minutes over on time, but I know there was a lot of uh, content, but we really wanted to give you a broader review of, of accessibility. Aaron and I will be here afterwards for a little bit if you have any questions. Otherwise, our email and uh, Twitter and stuff's up there, so feel free to shoot us a note if you have any questions. We'd, um, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you. Oh, actually, thank you.
I don't know if you have some thoughts on this, but um, as long as it's reasonably obvious to the user, I think you're probably okay. Um, but you know, it's, it's um, yeah. This is a visual question. I don't know what I'm doing. Yet. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, as Aaron said, if it is uh, supplementary information that's also conveyed in another way, it isn't necessary to have that uh, duplicated. Uh, as an example, uh, we've, been, we've written a very large application that we use internally, um, and we have hover state uh, to show status on some different icons and things like that. And so it's easiest for a visual user to do that because they don't need to see the status information all the time. But then behind that, we also have screen reader only text, so that same information is available to a screen reader as well. And when you have content appearing on hover, um, you want to make sure that that's also available to uh, to keyboard users, again, so so that's okay. uh, an equal experience as well. Uh, we have a question online uh, fr fr from our uh, friends who are watching the stream as well, and I'd like to um, pass on that. That's cool. Um, so uh, Kitty on the stream asks, uh, is there a screen reader, Aaron, that you prefer to use uh, out of JAWS and NVDA? Uh, and additionally, is there a browser or browsers that you prefer to use while using the screen reader? Great question. So currently, I use the ESR version, extended service release version of Firefox. Um, Firefox 58, when they switched to, uh, oh, I forget what that new thing is they, they came up with. Anyway, uh, it totally broke accessibility. And it's, it's recovering, but um, it's still better off in 53, which is what ESR is still on. So I use that. Um, Chrome is making awesome strides. I really got to give props to Google. Um, actually, one of the, uh, the folks who used to work for us ended up going to Google. Um, couldn't really discourage him from that. Uh, <laughs> but uh, he's, he's working on accessibility there. So, and, and they're really doing a tremendous job. And uh, so Br Chrome is up and coming in terms of accessibility. And, um, but Firefox ESR is probably the most accessible out of all of them. Um, as far as screen readers, JAWS and MVDA are pretty, pretty well neck and neck. We probably see a few more bugs with MVDA, but you know, sometimes JAWS has its bugs as well. So um, they're, they're pretty darn close uh, in terms of, of usage. Um, is it worth the $1,000 to get JAWS? Um, when NVDA is free, probably not. Well, thanks. Okay. <laughs> And that's, that's somewhere where tables are still uh, seen quite a bit in the wild. And you know I get it. Um, we've got to make them look reasonable in, in as many clients. And sometimes that means using a table. Um, so I would say there is a, a hack that you can use when you have to use a table for layout and there's no way around it. You can put a role, e um, let's see, role equals presentation. Uh, attribute on the table tag itself, and that will cause screen readers to ignore it in most cases, as long as you don't have any THs uh, with scopes in there. So, but you still need to make sure that your code is going to read in a logical order. So if you read the content in your table from top to bottom in your code, does it make sense? If so, then it's going to make sense to a screen reader. That order is going to make sense to a screen reader. So, uh, be looking at that. Tables are probably the biggest things 
Um, again, alt attributes on images, those are, those are the other big things. Um, and then just making sure that your links have labeled. Uh, so many of the emails that I see are, are um, just a bunch of links uh, that aren't labeled uh, or images that aren't labeled, which is you know, unfortunate. Um, Anchor, I love Anchor products. They, they make cell phone batteries and so forth. I subscribe to their emails, but uh, they're all basically useless to me. I can read the subject and that's about it. So. A, lot, a lot of people use their WYSIWYG editor to generate, you know, drag and drop to, to create the emails and then don't look at the code and it's horrible code that they're creating. So if you are doing that, look at the, the code that it generates as well. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> Perfect. Awesome. Yeah, and that's you know we're, I was talking about uh, accessibility as a process. So everyone in here is developers. They you know know how to do this stuff, but it's the people that you're working with that are using the WYSIWYG editors that are you know generating that content that are using site um, you know site builders and things like that that are adding the images to your shopping cart. Um, those types of things. Um, us as developers informing them that accessibility is a big part of uh, a big part of the process as well on their side, not just on the developer side. Yeah. If you're making a website. Accessibility is important. If you're making a library that a lot of people are going to use, it's going to be used on many different sites, I'd say accessibility is essential uh, because it's going to have such a greater impact than most sites anyway, unless you're Google. Yep. Uh, can you give an example of a time when you uh, convinced uh, a client or a supervisor to uh, <laughs> to uh, uh, give you budget to uh, address uh, accessibility concerns. Because I know uh, as a developer, a lot of, uh, there's a budget constraints and uh, we need to be able to convince people to allow us to address them. So at A360, we really push for the carrot approach to accessibility. Right. Here's the business case. Here's why it really does make sense for you as a business. Uh, even if you don't serve consumers, uh, you know, blind people need to work also um, and have jobs. So maybe you're making uh, uh, accessibility or software f that's only going to be used by businesses. Well, you know, again, uh, you're basically excluding folks from the job market if, if the tools that businesses are using aren't accessible. Um, but I think. To be honest, as much as we would like it to be the carrot right now, much of the motivation for many companies is reducing legal risk. Um, to be clear, I am not a very big fan of going out and suing in accessible websites. I think that's the wrong, absolutely wrong approach to it. I don't think it helps anybody. It just um, uh, makes people hate, you know, <laughs> hate, uh, hate doing it. Um, it's something they're forced into. Uh, but the reality is, is that tends to be the motivating factor for, uh, for most businesses uh, nowadays. Not all, certainly, and there are some, some great counterexamples, um, but uh, that's, that's a sad reality, unfortunately. The thing we have run into is, you know, companies in trouble, whatever, they're uh, auditing, they fix it and understand the pain of going back and sort of rewiring the house after it's already built. And so where budget comes in is on that next build. <laughs> the next time they do an iteration, they're including budget for, for accessibility in there. Any Anyone else? else? Clearly it was comprehensive. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys very much. One more time, please. <laughs>
Um, we'll say about 30 minutes or so, and then everyone should be making their way to the door. Thank you guys very much for coming out.